Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me is my lovely co-hostess with the most as Coindesk Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Christine. Good to see you. Let's take a look at what Bitcoin's doing. All right, the Coindesk Bitcoin Price XVX Index is currently trading at $42,072. Bitcoin slightly up about 42 basis points over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether Price ETX index is struggling to meet that 3,000 resistance level, trading at 29.13. ETH, though, climbing slightly about 40, about half. Uh, 50 basis points over the past 24 hours. And the new DFX, Coindesk's DeFi index right now, is at 549. DeFi trailing behind by about 2.4% for the day. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. All right, so Emily, it seems that we are having a slight bounce from yesterday, but still looking at the headwinds. We're looking at U.S. regulation. We're looking at China news. And more and more we're hearing um, out of China that firms are having to leave. We're hearing, hearing that from Bitmain, from uh, Ant Financial, uh, with the manufacturing that they're going to have to stop uh, for mining equipment. So is that still a concern? It's still a concern, but again, you know, I kind of stick to my previous assertion that, you know, the effect on Bitcoin has been less than one would have thought. As you said, we are seeing Bitmain, Alibaba sort of stopping sales of mining machines. You know, we are seeing other reports of other crypto exchanges leaving China. But again, this is all part of a larger narrative. I mean, this is these are all kind of expected results from China's crackdown. There's still regulatory uncertainty in the United States. And then there's other things that could be pushing Bitcoin's price down. For example, you know, there, there were the concerns over Evergrande. There were correlations with the stock market. There's the rise of DeFi. There's some people who think that Bitcoin just does badly in September. So as usual, you know, Bitcoin's rather, rather mysterious, but I don't think China is the only factor that is affecting prices right now. Right. And if, uh, and of course, if we look at year to date numbers, uh, Crypto is way up for the year, including Cardano, Absolutely. ADA, the third largest cryptocurrency by market cap, skyrocketing over 1,000 percent year to date. Behind that surge is the completion of Cardano's Alonzo hard fork, which introduces smart contracts onto the Cardano blockchain. And joining us now to discuss is Frederick Grigard, CEO of the Cardano Foundation. Hey there, Frederick. Great to have you on. So perhaps you can give us an update on smart contracts capability on Cardano. This is a huge upgrade. Uh, what does it mean for development on the Cardano blockchain? Well, it means a lot, really. So for five years, we've been on a journey to really change the world and take a couple of steps backwards and really do things, you know, very fireable, correct. So not just launching things and do trial and error, but really launching things at scale, which can bring 2 billion users to a blockchain. So the launch of the Alonso hard fork basically means that the close to 4,000 developers who's been in our uh, private testnet and been coding away on smart contracts, that they now also can go out there and actually launch that. But even more importantly, it also means that we now have a bridge between different technologies on the Cardano blockchain, which is the native assets, the combination of metadata and smart contracts. And that's really unparalleled in the blockchain space. Uh, welcome. So Cardano is obviously doing really well. One of the criticisms of Cardano has always been um, kind of a lack of use cases or a lack of usability. Can you tell us a little bit about what is currently the leading DAP on Cardano? Oh, yeah, that's probably pretty easy because we don't really have a leading DAP at the moment. You've only been able to do what you call a DAP or what the Ethereum community call a DAP for, for, yeah, for, for 17 days or something like that. Um, so, so we don't really have like that. And if you go into uh, to the DAP overuse, you won't find us there either. And that's really because um, a lot of things which is happening on blockchain has been around, you know, what is a DAP, what is a native assets, what controls transactions and how do you capture metadata and what does adoption really look like? So what we did is that, for instance, we merged identity into the blockchain very heavily. So we're onboarding 5 million users in Ethiopia to give them a digital identity in the education space. And you can ask yourself, you know, why is that important? Well, it's important both out of a macroeconomic perspective because it allows students in Ethiopia to jump over the border and verify and authenticate that they actually done all of the work uh, when they went to university. And it allows also the, 
Ministry of, of Education to verify certain things and, and to learn from certain things. On the flip side of that, what we see is that also allows us to, to do things which has been very hard on blockchain before. And that is really to merge metadata at scale and identity into the blockchain. So what we just announced here over the, uh, over the weekend is that we're doing a cooperation with Veritree uh, to plant 1 million trees. So a lot of these tree forestation um, companies and regeneration companies had a big issue in terms of proving you know, that uh, a tree was planted. It's always been, you know, you send some money and then you get a picture of a child or of a tree and then you're, you're feeling really good about yourself. But how far can you actually go in that, let's say, supply chain to ensure that not only do we become, you know, the greenest blockchain due to proof of stake, but also due to carbon offsetting, but also how really can we change the way we bring trust into different business models? And I think what's really truly unique here is that this is actually a utility token and not an NFT. And secondly, is that we are putting all the information about the token into the token itself. And that changes the trust equation compared to that you have to go on a website or a centralized database and you're thinking, oh, this might be a security or is this, you know, what kind of, what is, what am I actually trading here? So for those of you who are mm-hmm. into capital markets, you know that we put probably around 100 to 120 meter data points into a normal security. So we feel that this is the absolute minimum we can do on blockchain as well. And Frederick, um, so, are, are so these projects, are they operational right now? Yeah, they are. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. The uh, partnership with Ethiopia as well as the Veritree. Um, nevertheless, yeah, there so are... everything has to, yeah. So, I mean, everything takes time. And some of these deals has been, you know, years in the making and a lot of uh, negotiations. So there's not 5 million people in Ethiopia live today, but the system is being rolled out. And as you can imagine, bringing local schools and stuff like that on board, it takes a bit of time, but the deal is for 5 million. And over the weekend, we, we closed, I think, 25% or 23% of the trees uh, for 1 million trees. So this would mainly be mangrove trees, right? So we got a we did a little impact challenge. So we actually raised, uh, yeah, well, 250,000 trees, right? And one tree is, is equal one ADA uh, over the weekend alone. Um, and we just see that mounting up again, uh, you know, it's Tuesday now, right? So it's, uh, it's just moving forward. Um, and... Cardano has its fair share of detractors as well. Uh, for instance, Galaxy Digital's CEO, Mike Novogratz, has tweeted, I've learned one thing in the past 24 hours. Cardano has a passionate group of followers. I have no position and still think there are better level one alternative bets like Luna and Solana. Plus, I spoke to 20 of the smartest people I know in the space, and zero of them ha- saw Cardano having traction with devs. And so, Frederick, in there, I see two criticisms. One, there are better alternatives out there to Cardano, and I, I'd love to hear you address that. And number two, um, and, and Novograd specifically mentions Solana, Luna. Number two, there's no traction with devs, so not a very thriving developer community in Cardano. Would love to hear you address those criticisms. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question is always, what, what lens are we looking at? So let's have a look at uh, the Solanas and, and, and the Algorands and so on. Um, I think it's not going to be one blockchain who takes over the world and becomes like, you know, the, the, the only, you know, big brother where we can lock data and, and, and do certain things. There will be a multiple blockchains and they all have their own purpose. And we are definitely late to the market. I mean, we spent five years going back to academic research to do things right. And that's because we believe that if you really put 2 billion users on a blockchain and you merge that with identity and regulation, so you really has real FI and not just DeFi, which is needed to ensure that the regulators accept uh, the adoption on the chain, well, then things cannot break. And, you know, I always when I say that I'm holding the desk and I'm like, oh, my God, I hope we also don't break. But, you know, <laughs> I'm just so, you know, it's incredible proud of the time we've been live. We never had any downtime. And, and, you know, I get really worried when I see blockchains, uh, which is supposed to be decentralized and, and, you know, ready for government, that they go down or they are not, you know, that systems around them go down. This is, uh, blockchain is supposed to be a, a place where you get more trust and not less trust. So I think uh, that's the first thing I would say. It's really about, you know, getting the architecture right. And I hope that for us being slow means that we can hold the direction and be very strong. But we are maybe one or two years late in the market and according to smart contracts and other things which is out there. 
The other lens of looking at this is potentially thinking about the developer community and what is the developer community. So according to different data sets we have, there's around 26 million developers worldwide right now. It's really hard to figure out, you know, if you can just write two lines of code, are you a developer or do you need to be a software engineer? So this is the EDC numbers, which seems to be the most accurate. And out of those, only 0.03% of those has any interaction with blockchain and crypto. So that leads me to believe that, you know, when we're talking about the level of attraction, all of us are like behind. Because if you look at the potential of blockchain, we should have had a lot more enterprise developers to come on our platforms and really start changing the world and building decentralized apps. And the fact that For we don't just have that... Sorry. Yep. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I just want the to fact that we don't have that is an incentive problem. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at it today, what incentivizes an enterprise developer to come to a decentralized platform? I mean, there is uh, really sorry, no, no incentive. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Just, I wanted to make sure we could follow up quickly on Ethiopia before we wrap. Um, you know, it's a really ambitious project. You know, you're aiming for 5 million. It obviously takes time. I'm just curious, do you have numbers on like how many people are actually using it now? And just, you know, what is the timeline to reach that, that 5 million projection? Actually, I don't have numbers on that uh, right now. Um, but uh, I think the timeline will be years um, to get to the full adoption because things don't move over time. So the first, the first schools and so on, they are, you know, they are chalking away on it. And the first uh, dates has been issued, um, but I don't have a dashboard where we're tracking that. Um, Frederick, one thing that I think Cardano has been really, really good at is building community, right? I mean, it's I, I've always been so impressed with like how active uh, the Cardano community is just on social media and just kind of all over the world. I'm curious, like how, how were you able to do that, just build such like an active and involved community? And do you have a sense of geography, like where the majority of your users are based? We do have some numbers on that. And over the weekend, we had uh, what we call the Cardano Summit, which was a celebration of the Alonso Hard Fork. And we had over 80,000 registered attendants in over 40 countries who came live together and also virtually together to, to celebrate that. Um, we see that, unfortunately, mainly in the English-speaking countries or countries who has, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, they can speak English in either first, second or third language, that this is the strongest following. And this is something we work for the foundation also to spread. The other thing which we see is that a lot of the people who are following the Cardano for, for years, um, they're really in it to change the world and create a better place, where a lot of other blockchain projects are very isolated into changing one problem or maybe even you know, profit optimization. And I think therefore a lot of the, let's say the Cardano community is very loyal to us uh, because you know, we just stayed on the course uh, for such a long time and the, the community just keeps growing. It's really amazing. And it's been amazing to meet so many people um, in Wyoming where I was over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that sense from you for sure, Frederick, that it's very, it's peer reviewed, academic, and you're taking the slow and steady route rather than the break things, move quick and break things approach. Um, another question I wanted to ask you in terms of regulation was, uh, you know, the SEC uh, chair, Gary Gensler, is especially looking to crack down on crypto or maybe not crack down, but regulate the space in a more thorough manner. Is there ever any concern that Cardano could retrospectively be considered a security? Is it safe from the long arm of the SEC? So we truly believe in, in, in regulation enables innovation. And I think also what we saw with the infrastructure bill, uh, there is definitely some work to be done uh, across different geographies to ensure that we get this innovation. Um, I cannot you know, look into the crystal ball and, 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 and kind of say what a, uh, you know, what a regulator will say you know, years to come. But when we look at the how it's specifically uh, in the US, we have a lot of utility on chain. We have you know, information asymmetry is not present. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's very decentralized. It's the most decentralized blockchain out there today, uh, which also is a, is a drawback, right? So if we speak about other blockchains, they might have a, you know, a faster transactions per second or other things because they're very centralized. But, um, but uh, we believe in regulation. And I think the fact that we have, you know, an architecture who's built in for uh, economic identity and identity it really is going to help us uh, through the regulatory landscape compared to against it. Okay, Frederick, we gotta leave it there, but thank you so much for sharing your insights, uh, talking about your project and congratulations on your latest partnerships. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much and have a great that show. Was, that was Cardano Foundation CEO, Frederick Gagard. Coming up, checking in on Asia and the crypto markets update with Texture Capital.
Time now for the daily forecast, an update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, September 29th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Well, China's crypto crackdown has a lot of people in the business concerned about legal implications. According to China's PBOC notice, both people and companies providing services to overseas exchanges could be subject to investigation. We're going to take a look at the key issues and more coming up. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. First up, the question China's crypto ban has raised for many involved in the business is, are they going to come after me? Well, we've seen some companies in China react by shutting down their services altogether. Concerns remain over just how broad the scope of legal investigations could be. Forecast News' Timmy Shen got the lowdown from some of the top legal minds. The full legal ramifications of China's crypto ban remain unclear, with many worried about just how far investigations could reach. One expert told Forecast News that while organizations and their employees which facilitate cryptocurrency trading within a country and even individual traders could face penalties, Chinese nationals working overseas may not need to worry so much. If I put on my my sort of thinking cap of the, of the way that Chinese law would operate, then yes, they may be committing a crime, but the odds of them actually facing any penalty for that would be negligible. However, Haswell says there are concerns the ban could overspill into other jurisdictions, and that those within Hong Kong may be wondering whether it's the best place to be. But Ursula McCormack of Kinnanwood Malisons says it remains important to distinguish between mainland China and Hong Kong. We don't expect to see any change to the current trajectory of uh, the Hong Kong proposals for reforms uh, in relation to implementing a FATF uh, compliant framework for virtual asset services providers. Meanwhile, David Lesprince of Lesprince and Associates told Forecast News the ban is designed as a way of exerting control and that eliminating any competition to the digital yuan is the goal. For Forecast News, I'm Timmy Shan, Taipei, Taiwan. Meanwhile, over in Korea, the National Assembly has approved a ban on exchange employees trading crypto on their own platform. And hot on the heels of the recent crypto exchange regulations that essentially redefined the industry, who can do business, who can't, the ruling Democratic Party of Korea says it will start examining an independent law for crypto namely the Virtual Asset Business Rights Act. Forecast News' Danny Park has more on what this all means for investors in Korea. The Financial Services Commission revealed that the revised regulations were approved at the national policy meeting on Tuesday. They include a ban on crypto exchanges trading tokens developed by the operator or an affiliate and stopping exchange employees from trading crypto on their own platforms. The FSC says this is necessary for investor protection and better transparency, adding that there was already a case last year where an operator manipulated the price of its virtual assets for profit. Meanwhile, an independent virtual asset business rights law is under discussion. Park wan chair of the ruling party's policymaking committee, said the committee has started discussions, but lawmaking is not guaranteed, and it will be decided only after the two parties reach an agreement. The new law will focus on defining profit from virtual assets, either as financial income or other miscellaneous income, which will be the determining factor in taxing crypto investors. For Forecast News, I'm Danny Park. And finally today, let's end on a lighter note here. Gotta tell you about a new crypto trading superstar. And he's not your average trader. He's cute, he's furry. Mr. Gox is in fact a hamster. <laughs> his anonymous owners broadcast his trading activities via the streaming platform Twitch, with orders placed by him choosing to head through either the buy or sell tunnel. And why is he so popular? Well, like all the best oracle animals, he's been quite successful with his predictions. According to data from media outlet Protos, he's actually outperformed stock markets and even the oracle of Omaha himself, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. So given he's named after the crypto exchange that suffered one of the largest Bitcoin hacks in blockchain history, Mt. Gox, it's a show that we're gonna keep watching because he's just so damn cute. <laughs> and that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm forecast editor-in-chief Angie Lau. Until the next time.
The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. So checking in on Bitcoin, the Coindesk Bitcoin price XVX index is currently trading at 42,146. Bitcoin's trading pretty flat, but on the positive side, about 65 basis points up. The Coindesk Ether price ETX index right now at 29.21, climbing toward 3,000 resistance and up about 73 basis points. And the new DFX Coindesk's DeFi index trading right now at 549. DeFi taking a step back at about two and a half percent for the day. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Richard Johnson, founder and CEO of Texture Capital, a FINRA and SEC registered broker dealer with an online marketplace for private investments placements. Welcome, Richard. So Bitcoin is eyeing the biggest monthly price decline of about 10 percent. It's going to be the biggest monthly loss since May. Is September just not a good month for Bitcoin? What's your outlook? Uh, I, I don't know. I think I'm very much more glass is half full here. I think given all the news that we've had, it's remarkable that you know the, the crypto market and Bitcoin overall isn't off more than that. There's a couple of key key narratives going on. It's the China crypto ban, which we just spoke about there, um, and you know that that's huge. You know, back in the day, China used to be 50 percent of all all Bitcoin volume, and now they crack down on it, and uh, the market barely bats an eyelid. And the other and the other key thing going on, I think, is um, you know, the, the, the regulation, particularly in the U.S., where you know there's rumors of 180 or something like investigations currently underway by the SEC. Um, they're looking at you know the DeFi, the the, the Lend type products, and, and trying to figure out if there maybe their securities. There's you know there's uh, what is it, 80 billion locked in DeFi, another uh, 50 billion or so in some of the Lend products. So that's a big chunk of the market that's possibly at risk of some kind of uh, uh, you know, SEC action. And the fact that we're here floating around 42,000, I think is a very positive sign. Yeah, I think I would actually agree with that assessment. Um, do you think that the, the kind of red numbers that we've seen or the red charts we've seen in the past few days, do you even think that is a reaction to China or do you think that is more of a reaction to larger global pressures you know, that are also affecting the stock market? Yeah, it's hard to tell. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a volatile asset class that so moves up and down quite a lot anyway. Um, you know, it's probably hard to pick out what was actually driving it. Was it the China news? Is it the regulation? Is it, you know, you know some of the you know, hang ups in Congress here with infrastructure bills and, and the market down? Um, you know, it, it, it could be a number of different things, I think. On, on, the, on the China news, I think there's positives as well. Um, you know, we know that the, uh, the hardware suppliers have stopped shipping to China. Uh, but I think on top of that, what's happening is I'm hearing numerous stories about the mining operations that are in China are looking to kind of get their rigs out of there and into the U.S. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of energy in the U.S. There's there's renewable energy and there's some stranded gas assets which are increasingly coming online for Bitcoin mining. So when when this transition happens, if the U.S. starts taking over uh, a larger percentage share of the mining, um, then that's going to be good overall for things like Bitcoin ETF. A lot of concerns around the, the ETF and approving these types of things was the global nature and who are these other actors participating on the network and so on. So, you know, there's a positive side to this as well, for sure. Are you anticipating what investors in Asia, such as China, South Korea, Korea, both countries are clamping down on crypto in their own ways? What will happen to these investors? Do you see them exiting the market, just freezing their holding so far or, or potentially moving into DeFi? Yeah, they'll move to DEXs if they can. Um, if, you know, you know, if, if China's not able to block those, I think they'll try to move. You know, some maybe get, will, will get out of it. Some may figure out um, you know, how to get access to kind of, you know, uh, you know, other jurisdictions. But I think a lot of people will move to DEXs for their trading. Mm -hmm. And are you looking at any preferred smart contract protocols? We just had Cardano on, but I, I want, I'm curious about what uh, you, you deal with a lot of wealthy investors. Are, are they buying the dip or has a spigot gone dry? Are they going moving to smart contract protocols? I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, certainly I think this is you know, probably a decent buying opportunity down here. I don't see it, you know, if it's holding up at 42 with all this negative news, I don't see it going below 40. Uh, certainly not back to those lows we saw earlier this year. I am a fan of the smart contract platforms. You know, I like uh, you know Polkadot and Avalanche. 
Um, they, they're down, uh, you know, a little bit more than the market. Um, um, I am a fan of the kind of the DeFi tokens as well, like Uniswap, uh, Maker, Compound. They're also, you know, down a little bit more than the overall market. Um, on, you know, speaking about the DeFi protocols, these have real use cases. Um, between them, I think they're generating 20 to $30 million in revenue per month. There's a lot of coins out there that, you know, as we know, don't have any use cases. So um, in general, as a firm, we're very bullish on all the innovation in DeFi. We, we feel that there's a way to bring this into the regulated, into regulated framework. And I think that's when the, when the opportunity increases you know, even further for this type of technology. You've got, like I said, 80 billion locked in DeFi right now. There's 500, 600 trillion dollars of securities out there that could potentially be leveraging, leveraging this type of technology. Definitely a lot of opportunity out there. All right, Richard, thank you so much for the update. That was Texture Great, Capital CEO Richard Johnson. Coming up, musical artist BT on all NFTs, his latest NFT album, and checking in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day. Time to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto newsletter. Good morning, Nick. So I see that the Commodities Futures Trading Commission and Kraken have reached a settlement. Tell me a bit about that. Good morning. Yes, Kraken will pay a $1.25 million fine in settling charges with the CFTC that uh, it offered, quote, illegal off-exchange uh, margin retail commodity products. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a very big fine, but uh, it's pretty significant. Kraken says it, uh, you know, proactively stopped offering this product to U.S. traders back in June, after only a year of you know offering in the first place. And uh, you know, it's kind of it seems to be one of those settlements where you know both parties can walk away saying, yeah, you know, we got something out of this, uh, without any major, um, you know, nothing major in terms of penalties or, uh, you know, slaps in the face and certainly no drawn out legal fight. Nick, are we likely to see this exchange to uh, this extended to other exchanges in the U S this kind of thing? Uh, wouldn't be surprising. I'm not too familiar with which exchanges offer, you know, uh, leverage, uh, or margin products in the U S but, you know, I imagine any exchange that does or has, you know, even so much as offered to maybe paying attention uh, maybe it has already heard from the CFTC. Um, you know, if they haven't heard from it, then you know maybe they're okay. But yeah, this is the kind of thing where you have to register as a futures commission merchant and a uh, designated contract uh, market. And uh, you know, not that many exchanges have these kinds of licenses from the CFTC or the National Futures Association. Nick, we've been hearing a lot about the China crypto crackdown, which will make way for their digital yuan to be the exclusive digital currency in China. But what about the United States? Anything new on the digital dollar? So yesterday, Fed Chair Powell was speaking to the Senate Banking Committee and uh, Senator Pat Toomey did ask about this. Um, Basically, Powell's response is Congress should come up with some legislation that authorizes the Fed to issue a digital dollar. Uh, you know, if there are any specific details, then you know he's kind of throwing the ball into Congress's court. He's not committing to launching anything or going beyond you know the reports and the analysis that are already ongoing uh, without this kind of backup from the legislature. All right, Nick. Thanks for the update. Keep, uh, okay. keep buying all the regulation for us. That was Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. BT, a Grammy-nominated trans artist and software designer, is launching a Metaversal today, an NFT album, and cryptographic treasure hunt. Have a peek. Imagine a world where the music of the past becomes the music of the future, refined.
Looks pretty awesome. All right, fans can grab a piece of the programmatic album on Origin Protocol. And joining us now is musical artist BT. Welcome to the show, BT. All right, first of all, yeah, good morning. Can you walk <laughs> us through the experience? What is a programmatic album? Tell us about what the user experience is going through this. Fantastic question. You know, I really wanted to reimagine what's possible in the time we're living in um, as an album, as an experience. And so w what I did was I, I built basically an album and adapt to house that album. So uh, Metaversal 100,000 line of code uh, software base that lives with permanence on blockchain and it has Web 3.0 connectivity. So the actual program itself plays the music I've written back different during the daytime, uh, the nighttime, and even during the full lunar cycle, which was complex to do without an oracle because the blockchain is time agnostic, as everyone watching this knows. So uh, one of the coolest things about the project is this DAP contains a, a treasure hunt for my fans to solve. So we'll be seeding all these cryptographic puzzles and riddles on social media, and at the end of them, you arrive at one of three sequences that the album can be rearranged into, and that sequence unlaps, uh, unlocks its activity, and uh, fans will be airdrop very secret, one of one NFTs that are utility tokens of a sort, but I shouldn't say more about that. So um, it really is this uh, new sort of envisioning of what's possible insofar as music releases and i hope that it inspires some of my peers and other folks in the music community to see what an incredible time we're, we're living in insofar as the arts and what's possible wow that's incredible okay and metaversal is being released as a tiered auction on origin protocols nft launchpad with 11 spots to be filled but anyone is free to participate in solving metaversal what does that mean exactly it means that it's really it kind of splits into into two things. There's a we're having um, a uh, eleven tiered auction, as you mentioned, on or Origin Protocol for the actual code base itself, and some other really really cool things. Um, we've partnered with Lago, and so the actual program comes with this beautiful uh, wall hanging NFT. For um, and um, I use Python scripts for every single song on the album and did a fast forward form analysis of the song and turned it into a sculpture. So each piece for the album, we made 11 of them, has an accompanying sculpture of an audio waveform that actually has an embedded NFC tag. So the sculpture itself is bound to an a Ethereum mainnet NFT token. So the actual sculpture is on the blockchain. Um, so there's two experiences. One is for uh, folks that like the crypto art, and that's the 11 tiered auction. And the other is this cryptographic treasure hunt that's for my fans to solve, mm -hmm. and they can win, you know, one of one NFTs um, uh, frictionless. So the barrier to entry is being smart, basically. <laughs> <laughs> So there are a lot of artists out there who know about NFTs, that it creates a direct line to their fans, but they don't exactly know how it works. And you mentioned barrier to entry, uh, have to be tech savvy. But um, you clearly have a sound understanding of how this works in terms of gamifying the experience, creating this treasure hunt while adding your artistic sense for music to it. So so what, what advice would you give to an artist who wants to get into NFTs to better understand and, and maybe not just, you know, it's not as easy as an, an NFT drop. I, I, it's such a fantastic question. And, and like I said previously, I really hope that Metaversal inspires certainly my peers in the electronic community to think bigger than, you know, what we see as the kind of typical, possibly generative projects or, or uh, JPEG type releases. It's so remarkable what's, what's possible with you know, smart contract development. And so I would recommend that you know, to friends and to peers in the music community that they really investigate uh, what's happening under the hood here and what's possible and to look at artists like 
Pack and um, Mad Dog Jones and um, I'd like to thank myself as well, you know, in insofar as creating things that are really experiential and fall outside of the norm of what we think of in in media in general, not just art and music. So do you see this as the future of music in that you're creating these experiences for your fans, not only just in, in live shows, but also virtually and, and, and that you have to present a game to them to create this community. Yeah, it's it's a, a really interesting thought. You know, I think think the thing that I see more than anything as being the future in this the sort of programmatic and blockchain space is the disintermediation of the middleman. You know, for for a great number of years, the music community, the art community has been beholden to gatekeepers and through this kind of direct contact between artists and their audiences it's going to empower the world to be a better sounding and more beautiful place and it sounds a little um hippy dippy but we're watching that play out you know we're seeing uh, artists that would have never been able to find an audience reach their community you know create communities and create experiences so yeah i do think that it's the future of, of music and art. And I just want to encourage people to really dream big and, you know, yeah. execute even bigger. This was are just you still the, the dealing with a, a label dream. or now are you able to just go off on your own, create your own projects and not rely on their marketing? I, so, you know, for, for this project, we're releasing directly to the blockchain. And I'm, I'm sure at a point in the future, we will um, make this so people can hear it in a different way. But I think it's such a cool thing to release an album in a piece of software where the only way you can hear it to start, you know, it's not going to be on DSPs to start, is the way that, you know, in this case, myself designed it to be listened to. So it's there um, with, you know, it'll be owned by a single person. Um, it will live on the blockchain immutably forever and anyone can go experience it I for free. I am curious, so. do you make more money this way versus going the, the label route? Uh, that's a good question. I guess you can ask me later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but um, but you know, honestly, the real the the real want here is is to and and also to I mean, if you look historically at my career, is is always trying to break through the ceiling of what's possible, whether it's developing music software, whether it's you know performing as yeah. an electronic artist live with an orchestra. You know, whatever it is, I'm I'm constantly trying to innovate, and so yeah. um, this is uh, a space that I'm so, so excited to be in. Kind of unspeakable. It's it's the intersection yeah. of my three favorite things: art, music, and technology. It's, it's, it's I could well, be it's happier. beautiful uh, from the images that I've seen so far, and uh, yeah, good luck to you. I mean, but I've seen your NFTs have done very well. The last one fetched about almost ninety ETH, and so it seems you're on a good path here. BT, thank you so much. Metaversal, the blockchain software me. album and cryptographic treasure hunt is up for grabs today on Origin Protocol. Thank you, BT. That was musical artist BT. All right, time to check in with crypto Twitter with our tweet of the day. This one from and the New York Times tech columnist Kevin Bruce tweeting, I love NFT Twitter because it's half 20 tweet threads about how blockchains will be the Medici's of a new artistic renaissance and half guys trying to convince you to spend $10,000 on stuff called like Daryl's deformed donkeys. True say. That's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker, our Coindesk Managing Director of International Content. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all about Bitcoin, but be sure to catch the folks on the hash at noon. You're watching Coindesk TV.